tool. All right, I'll begin with a word of prayer. So, dear Holy Father, we uh, thank you for this day. I thank you for these students. I just pray you be with us today. Help us to uh, understand a little bit more about your creation, about vector fields, and I just pray that you be glorified, Lord, and we do. In your name I pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so um, I have a, something I want to show you on the computer here. Hopefully my batteries will last long enough for us to see it. Oh, no one wants to see that. Let's see here. So I, I found this little applet. I think it's really cool. Basically, what it does is it um, illustrates. So one of the principal things you might think about with a vector field is maybe the vector field is, so it's an application of a vector at each point in space, right? What is a vector field? You take some object and you attach a vector to each point in the object, right? Uh, we talked about a vector field along a curve when we talked about the Fresnay Ray equations, right? We found the TNB frame, which at each point along the curve, you attach a, a tangent normal and binormal, right? Uh, a vector field in the, in the plane is an attachment of a vector at each point in the plane. And then you could say, well, that's, that's great, that's math, but what is it? Well, one of the things it could be is the vector could point in the direction of the velocity of fluid flow. So you could imagine that the plane has some kind of liquid in it, and um, you could imagine that the vector field that you're given, it points in the direction in which the fluid is flowing. If that was the case, then you could then imagine putting little particles in the fluid and studying the flow of those particles along the streamlines of that vector field, and that's kind of what we're looking at here. This would be some sort of like swirling liquid, right? And so you, I don't, I haven't even plotted the vector field, but you could, you could appreciate that there is a vector field there that's twirling around the center point, right? And um, with this one, I can even, uh, this is not mine, right? This is from uh, www.falstad.com. Uh, I found it with a very complicated and sophisticated approach. I, I, I Googled it. Um, let's see here. It was really hard. And um, <clears throat> I can, uh, I think I can, let's see, I'm trying to find it. Um, they're the streamlines. Those, those are the integral curves to the vector field that we're looking at. So the vector, the vector field of the fluid flow here is actually tangents to these. As you can see, they're pushing. Oh, whoa. Oh, no. The space is tearing. <laughs> That's something else. But they have, he has other, other really cool, oh my, ooh, yowzers. That, that's somehow three-dimensional, right? But it's not. <laughs> um, that's kind of, yeah. Let's see here. Uh, no, that's not what I want. The one it loaded up to start with was really cool. Um, there's so many choices on this thing. Like here is a picture of let's see here. I don't know, I just like, what? That's weird. This kind of defect right there. So as you can see, there are many different possibilities for a vector field. I mean, you, the, the, the possibility is really endless. I'm going to get rid of the stream, streamlines. It's more fun without, hey, I said get rid of them. There we go. Woo! See what else we got here. Ugh. Reset. Ah, now I've gotten stuck with those little blue things, huh? I like this one, though. That's pretty cool, right? We could decrease the number of particles. Yeah, something kind of like what you imagine for a black hole somehow. Increase the number of particles. Ah, oh, they're all dying. Let's see here. Field strength. Ah, slower. But the, you know, they're eventually going to get sucked into that, aren't they? Sphere size. What's the... Ooh. I know. I'm sorry. This... I guess this isn't really going to help you solve problems at all, but maybe <laughs> it, might, it might at least give you some ideas about what's possible geometrically for streamlines and for the flow of particles, right? 
And so there's, there's, there's a rich structure that's possible for the different, fl different flow patterns of particles in a plane, right? And each one of these flow patterns would come with some particular vector field. And we'd kind of like to understand, you know, how do you analyze vector fields that describe such complicated flows? Like, what can we systematically say about them? How do we study them? What's their calculus, right? And that's what the rest of the course is mostly about. Um, here's, a, here's a slightly less, um, um, you know, <laughs> here. This is the vector field x comma 4. So it, it, um, it's always going 4 vertically. And its x component is just x. So it point in the, when x is positive, it points to the right. When x is negative, it points to the left. And I've color coded it. The color is based on the magnitude. I set the color equal to the square root of x squared plus 16, which is the magnitude of that vector at the point. Now we could do other things, right? Like what would happen if I put x, y here? And I'll color code it so that it's based on the magnitude again. See what we have? So this is the outward pointing vector field. Its magnitude is 0 here, and its magnitude gets longer and longer the further you get out. So color coded. But the, the, you know, the possibilities are really endless. What you could do here, I could do y minus x cubed. That would do something interesting, right? Ooh. So that's, that's kind of funky. Let's see here. I don't know. It's fun to think about what are the different possibilities. Just adjusting formulas, different patterns you can get. You know, these are vector fields, though. Right. So. All right. So again, a vector field is just in the plane. We can look at a vector field basically um, as a mapping from, say, Rn to Rn in some sense, right? So in other words, a vector field is something like F1, F2, dot Fn. Now, I sometimes might want to write that as something like this. Um, and, you know, I, I think, I mean, in this current notation, I think of this being attached at the point, you know, at, at x. So, you know, to say it's a function from Rn to Rn is a, a slight abuse. I mean, you, you might think that it's really mapping into the space of you know, each, the vector field at x is mapping to vectors at x, right? So when I write this, it's slight abuse of, 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 of concept. Perhaps instead of writing Rn here, I should say something like the tangent space to Rn, where the tangent space to Rn is formed from all possible sets of vectors attached to different points. That's the viewpoint I would take in a, in a later course. All right. Anyway, the point is, in R2, this is mostly what we're looking at is R2 and R3, our vector field looks like something like this. Our typical notation is P comma Q. All right. In R3, our typical vector field is P, Q, R. Right. And when I use this bracket notation, you should remember it's, it's a shorthand for Cartesian, the Cartesian frame. So that's P x hat plus Q y hat. Here we have P x hat plus q y hat plus r z hat. Of course, we could also express the vector fields with respect to, say, the cylindrical coordinate frame or the spherical coordinate frame. And we'll do that when the time is right, not today. OK, so have we already come into contact with some vector fields in this course? What's a primary example? What's that? Alpha, alpha f, what? Nabla. Oh, nabla, yeah, oh, nabla, exactly, that's what I was looking for. So the, the critical example is, is the, the gradient, right? The gradient 
gave us fx, fy, or fx, fy, fz, right? And of course, these are examples of vector fields, right? Now there's a natural question to ask then, right? OK, so f equals to the gradient of, of some little, little function f is, you know, as an example of a neg as an example <coughs> of a vector field, right? What's the kind of reverse question to that? So given, let's say, g equals to pqr, is it possible to write g as the gradient of some other function g? I mean, it's certainly the case if I have a function f and I take the gradient or the nabla of it, right, that gives me a vector field. But can I, ask the, can I do the reverse? Given a vector field, is it possible to write it as the gradient of some scalar function? That's an important central question for the mo most of the remainder of this course that we're going to think hard about, OK? I'm not going to answer for it for you, the answer to that question right now. It's a question we want to ask, though, and answer. I will tell you this. If it's possible, then g is said to be conservative. A conservative vector field is one for which you can write it as the gradient of some, some potential function. I mean, you can kind of tell the answer is no, not all vector fields, right? But Understanding that with some care is a question that, that will occupy some of our time. OK. so. <clears throat> Um, just as a point of organization, and, and this is not perhaps logically um, the most optimal path, but it's a path we can take. I'm going to show you how to do the calculus of vector fields today. So what's the calculus of vector fields? Or you might, you might think of this as the differential vector calculus. I've already shown you part of this in the course already. We were just talking about that. If you have a scalar, scalar function f, then we can go to gradient of f, a vector field, right? We know how to do that. So oh, by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on n equals 3 now three dimensions. What else could you do with, with Nabla, though? Let's just think about Nabla. Like, what is Nabla? Think about Nabla for a second. Nabla basically is what? It's x hat partial x plus y hat partial y plus z hat partial z. We could think of it that way, right? So what is, what is Nabla f? It's just you let f be acted on by Nabla, right? Just apply f to that symbol. That's the gradient. Did you guys see it? What else could you do with a vector, though? There are two things, right? You can take dot products, and you can take, take, take cross products. And we can do the same with nabla. So if I'm given a vector field, let's say f, and I'll, I'll, I'll stick with the PQR notation for a second here. Ah, no, I just I can't do it. I'm going to go with F1, F2, F3. It's just better for this discussion. You can think F1 is equal to P, F2 is equal to Q, F3 is equal to R if it makes you happier. So nabla dot F would be what?
Mm -hmm. But this, this should be a what? It's a dot product, right? Well, I would think of it this way. The x hat of this one and the x hat of that one, I mean, what, what's, what's a dot b? It's a1, b1, plus a2, b2, plus a3, b3, right? So if we think of this as being, you know, we could also look at this as like this, in a sense, right? Now, what I'm telling you is just a, a mnemonic, right? I mean. What I'm, write, I'm what I'm about, what I'm about to write is just to simply the definition, so I don't really have to explain it. I'm just trying to show you uh, kind of a way you might think of it just through formal nonsense, really. <laughs> um, but it, it, it is this. It's, it's partial x of f1 plus partial y of f2 plus partial z of f3. Or if you want me to rewrite it in a better way, I could simply say it's this. It's the summation i equals 1 to 3 of partial f sub i, partial x sub i. It's the sum of the derivatives of the ith component functions with respect to the ith, co ith coordinate, um, coordinate uh, ith coordinates. You can easily see how to de generalize the divergence to n dimensions as well, right? If I was going to do this in two dimensions, what would the divergence be? You just take i equals 1 to 2, right? In four dimensions, you let i go from 1 to 4, but otherwise the same. This is the so-called divergence of f. So the divergence of f, what does it do? It takes in a vector field and it spits out a, what's this? Right, this is a scalar function. It's a function though, right? A scalar function, generally speaking. What's the other thing? So that, 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 again, this is a definition. I'm not really deriving anything per se. I'm just trying to explain to you by essentially formal nonsense that that's what you could do. But yet more formal nonsense, the nabla cross f. Well, we had a, we had a really, awesome formula for the cross product, and I'll use that now. So this is the summation over i, j, and k, 1 to 3, of epsilon i, j, k, partial i, f sub j, and um, x hat sub k. There's a, there's a nice formula for the so-called curl of f, or sometimes called the rotation. Um, so just, you know, this is also sometimes called the divergence of f. Um, this is sometimes called curl of f like that. I prefer nabla cross f because it kind of gives you an indication on how you actually calculate it. Now there's a mnemonic for this. You can do this. It's the determinant of x hat, y hat, z hat, partial x, partial y, partial z, f1, f2, f3. But you got to be careful to do things in the right order, right? Like what this means is x hat times partial y, f3, minus partial z, f2, minus y hat, partial x f3 minus partial z f1 plus z hat partial x f2 minus partial y f1. As you can see, I shifted back to x, y, z rather than, I mean, I, 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 I freely interchange between these two notations. x1 is equal to x, x2 is equal to y, x3 is equal to z. Why do I do this? It's because the summation notation formulas are just far clearer for just the general structure of things, right? But when you're actually doing calculations, nobody wants to do calculations in x1, x2, x3, right? x, y, z are way easier to write. Subscripts are, um, you don't want to calculate with subscripts if you can get away with it. So, 
So there you go. Those are your three differential uh, vector calculus uh, constructions. You have the gradient, the divergence, and the curl. And those are it. Pretty much that's what we got to work with. Shall we calculate some? Let's just calculate a few. Let me let f, e, f of x, y, z equal to, let's say, x squared plus y, comma, y cubed, comma, x, z. Let's calculate the curl and divergence of this vector field, OK? I'll start with the easy one, divergence. is partial partial x of the x component plus partial partial y of the y component plus partial partial z of the z component. Which gives me what? 2x plus 3y squared plus what? X, yeah. And there you have it. Now the curl, right? Let's calculate the curl. Curl of f is equal to what? So what I have is, let's see here, partial partial y, partial y of the z component, which was x, z minus partial z of the y component, which was y cubed. Um, but um, but um, partial z of the x component, which was x squared plus y, minus partial x of the z component, which was xz, partial x of the y component, which was y cubed, minus partial y of the y component, which was, I mean x component, which was uh, x squared plus y. Admittedly, there's a lot to keep track of with the calculation of a curl, right? It's just like a cross product. It's got a lot of signs, a lot of opportunities for arithmetic mistake. Got to be careful with these. What do we get? A zero, zero. What do we get here? Zero. Oh, there's one, minus z. How about this one? Minus 1, right? So there you have it. The curl is another vector field, right? So do you guys understand how to take divergence and curl now? I think I haven't hurried it. You, you should follow it along. If I was to ask you, would you like one of these on the next test? If you're wise, you should say, please put this on the next test. I would much prefer this to an optimization problem. Yes, absolutely. No brainer. <laughs> I mean, this is mechanical. There's not much logic involved here, right? What's that? I'm just messing with you guys. I wouldn't do that. Like I said, you got enough on your plate already. But on the fourth test, it'll be there. Don't worry. Um, all right, so let's look at another example. Let's calculate the curl of the gradient of f. So what's the curl of a gradient? So we're calculating the curl of what? fx, fy, 
fz. I'm going to go ahead and use the mnemonic this time. I want the determinant of x hat, y hat, z hat, partial x, partial y, partial z, um, fx, fy, fz, right? So this gives me what? Partial y, fz, minus partial z, fy. Then partial z, fx, minus partial x, fz. Then um, partial x, fy, minus partial y, fx. that. What if I rewrote this just a little bit differently? This is fzy minus fyz, fxz minus fzx, fyx minus fxy. What is it? Say, no, say it. Zero, yes. That is true. The curl of a gradient is zero. Hmm. Looks like we've already found a partial answer to this question. A little bit. I mean, we're start. We got starting to get something about this. So let's think about this question. The previous example, this f, is it conservative? Yeah. I have no idea, but I have a question. Okay. Um, so down here, when you're talking about the curl of f, yep. you put that equation in red, and you're just like, so x hat, or, and then underneath y hat, you have dx, fz, minus z. Is that how the example? Right. I distributed the minus. I mean, this could be rewritten as plus y hat times z1 minus x3. Um, it's because I didn't write y hat times stuff. I just absorbed the minus into the y component. Um, that is a good observation. Es bueno? I'm not convinced. Um, well, that's the way we wrote the cross product before sometimes. We, put a mi we do plus minus on the expansion by cofactors. So if you're doing the expansion by minors, or Laplace's expansion, there's a minus in the formula. But I mean, if I'm just writing uh, a, a, you know, a triple of things without the x hat, y hat, I, I want to absorb the minus into here. I always go back to the basic thing, which is this pattern, right? So if I'm looking at the y component, if I've got like x cross, if I, me, if I got z cross x, that gives me a plus, right? But if I do x cross z, it gives me a minus. So when I'm looking at the y hat, z cross x is the order, so that's the plus, whereas this is the minus because it's opposite the circle. I always go back to the circle and do it like internally, that's what I'm thinking. So a question. Is it possible, question, is this the gradient of some scalar function f?
what would the curl of, so if it was the case, right? If it was the case, you'd have the curl of f is equal to the curl of the gradient of the scalar function, which by the example we just worked is zero. And yet this is not zero, right? So no, it's not possible. This is not a conservative vector field. And there you go. If you're th wondering what's the use of the curl, that's one use. Is it's, it gives you a no-go theorem. If the curl is non-zero, eh, not conservative. It's probably instructive for us to, oh man, I missed my chance. I should have written this in PQR. What happens if you rewrite this in PQR notation? What's the curl in PQR notation? Yeah, work it out. We got a minute. Let's do it. Calculate the curl of the vector field PQR. What do you get? See if you guys can recognize it. Oh, I'm using this, I'm using this inferior eraser. What's wrong with me? I've got a perfectly good shirt over here to erase over there. There we go, that's better. So what do you, what'd you guys say it is? <laughs> Let's see here. So I'll write it out symbolically. This is partial x, partial y, partial z, crossed with pqr. Again, this is just a mnemonic. The definition is what I'm writing down here. Um, so that's partial y, r, minus partial z, um, Q, comma, let's see here, partial Z, um, R, oh, excuse me, partial ZP minus partial X, sorry, processing R, um, partial X, Q minus partial YP. Those being zero, those are exactly the conditions we needed for the vector, for the differential equation PDX plus QDY plus RDZ to be exact. That was a homework problem you guys had, remember? So these vanishing, those are the, those are the conditions that we need on PQR for it to be conservative. And that, that corresponds to the insistence that the partial derivatives commute when you look at the potential functions, second derivatives. Oh, the f, um, this little f up here, it's usually called a, a potential function for the vector field f. Yep. That is an implication of conservative, right? It's an open question as to whether the converse is true or not. Does the curl being zero imply that it's conservative? This we don't know yet. Certainly, if it is conservative, then the curl is zero. Can we reverse that? Logically, yet, we don't have the right. The answer is sometimes. And the qualifications for when it's true or not true is actually topological. Yep. Uh, is it true that the, the curl of a gradient is always zero? The curl of a gradient is always zero. That's right. That's what this shows. There's no, you know, I'm assuming, of course, that the function f can be twice differentiated. It's not some sort of malevolent, you can differentiate it once, but aha, second derivatives can't be calculated kind of thing. So I am assuming that the function is at least smooth. But anyway, you guys don't want me to start picking at that kind of detail on your test. So <laughs> I assume that's not what you're asking about. <laughs> um, OK, so then what else? What are the other properties of divergence, curl, gradient? What, what are the, there, there surely must be some more properties. We've, we've seen some examples. I've started to illustrate to you the meaning, all right, in term, as it connects with conservative vector fields. Um, 
So what are the properties? Now, for the gradient, we've already seen these. This is previous in the course, right? Nabla, um, nabla of f times g was what? It was nabla f times g plus f nabla g, right? We had that before. We've, we've proved that previously. If we have nabla of a sum, what do you get? Some of the nablas, some of the gradients, right? Sorry. Sometimes saying nabla is just fun. Um, <laughs> what else is there, though? Eh. I guess we also had that um, if you had, um, how was it? How was it? Uh, oh, I'm thinking of something else. I'm thinking of other chain rules. That doesn't matter for us right now. That was it for the gradient, I think. Those are the main ones. How about, how about the uh, divergence? Well, certainly the divergence of f plus g, right? And if I had a scalar, I could pull it out. It, it is true, in fact, that that's c times the divergence of f plus the divergence of g. So divergence, we can also prove, has that linearity. What else could we think about? How about if I take the divergence, but this is a c constant, right? What if I had, instead of c being a constant, what if I had a function? The divergence of, say, a function f times a vector field g. Is there some kind of product rule there? Now think about it logically. What does the answer have to be? The answer has to be a scalar function, right? And you kind of expect it to obey some kind of product rule, right? So here's, here's what happens. You get, anybody want to guess? Oh, sorry. Derivative of f, how about uh, gradient of f, g, plus f nabla g. Now, you, I'm not, not quite done yet. What, what symbols do I have to put in in order to make this make sense? <laughs> no, I, I saw you. It's OK. <laughs> Connect the dots. Yeah, how about parentheses here? There has to be a dot with that gradient, right? Vector field dot vector field gives me back scalar function, right? And over here, to make this make sense, that has to be the divergence of g. And, and how about maybe you can do the same thing. Um, this, this same, if you'll allow me this shorthand, you could just as well do this with, with curl, right? It's, it's also true that the curl is linear. And in fact, it's also true that the curl has exactly that product rule. Oh, no, that wouldn't make sense. I have to think about that some more. Yes, sir? Oh, here, scalar function. Scalar function, vector field. Uh, I don't think that's true, actually. I mean, not without considerable qualification. Let's think about the product rule for the um, curl. OK, so the product rule, take the curl of, say, a scalar function f times a vector field g. First of all, does this make sense? It should make sense. If a scalar function times a vector field is still a vector field, right? Like, for example, if I take this f and I multiply it by the exponential of x, y, z, it's still a vector field. You just got exponential x, y, z multiplying each component. So we can definitely do that. That makes, it's, it makes sense to try to do it. Now, and I, my intuition tells me it should be something like gradient of f g plus f um, gradient g. But to make this make sense, this, the output should be what? Yeah, output again, vector field. OK, so if that's the case, then I have to do 
what, to get a vector field from the gradient and another vector, I have to take the cross product here and here. Um, I have to take the curl. Now that makes sense, at least um, in terms of objects, because I've got a vector field plus another vector field. So it should be, again, a vector field. Now is this true? How would you prove it? Here's the proof. The curl of f times g is equal to a sum, ijk, of, well, epsilon ijk. And then what, what is the, what's the ith, if you take fg, the vector, and you look at its ith component, what is it? Exactly. So this would be partial i, and then I should say the jth component. So that's f times g sub j. So I do of f times g sub j, x hat k rides along. That's the definition of the curl, written in the most efficient notation that I know. Sure. sure. What? Yeah, sure. Oh, thank you. Better. It's better. Much better. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Can I erase the definition? Well, I'm going to leave it there for a second. So I just applied the definition with instead of f, I have little f times g, right? I mean, but otherwise, same. But this is what? This is the derivative of a product of a function f times a function g sub j, right? So I do the product rule. In the ordinary sense of calculus, well, three. <laughs> I'd say calculus one, but it is a function of several variables, so I do need this semester's math. Fine. So this is the summation over ijk, epsilon ijk, and then I get partial if, um, parentheses gj, plus f times partial i gj. And then I simply distribute and rip this apart into two summations. So this is the sum over ijk, epsilon ijk, um, partial if, parentheses gj, x hat k, plus the sum over ijk. And I can pull, on the second term, I can pull this scalar. F has no dependence on the sum over ijk. It's just sitting there multiplying the summation. So I can pull it out of the sum. I can pull it out to here like that. And then what I have is an epsilon ijk, partial i gj, x hat k. But then I just have to, again, apply the definition of curl to recognize that the second, the second term here, well, this you have to recognize that's exactly just the curl of g, right? And this over here is nothing more than the gradient of f cross product, uh, rather, um, yeah, cross product with, with g. And that's exactly what I wanted to prove. Now the proof of the divergence property is much the same. It's just instead of having the epsilon ijk riding along, you just, it's, it's even simpler, actually. It's bueno? Fine. Oh, yes, Mike, sorry. I'll learn eventually. Now there are there are there are still more identities. There are yet more identities to learn. These ones I may or may not remember 
off the top of my head. These are more difficult. This is Proposition 7.24. Um, here I have, um, you know, vector fields and, well, just, I don't know why I have, I have, in the proposition, I have let f, little fgh be real valued functions and then big fgh vector be vector fields, but then I never do anything with a little fgh. It's kind of a, it's a typo of uh, not omission, but I don't know, maybe commission, uh, what, what, I don't know. I'm not, Typo, a typo of addition. <laughs> I like that. See, we're, we're discussing what we should call the the business calculus course here, right? Is it now the the politically correct thing to call it is applied calculus? But then sometimes you want to call it baby calculus. But then I've been told that that's offensive. But then, um, but I mean, what do those people have against babies? But. Um, one of my students was telling me, you should just call it almost calculus. And I thought, <laughs> yeah, it's almost calculus. I don't know, I just, it's so hard in there. Like, I can't say anything about sine and cosine. It's, I love sine and cosine, but I'm not allowed to talk about them. It's, it's very disturbing. It's very disturbing. Okay, but here, we don't have these problems. Divergence of the curl. Oh, why would you do that? Why would you do that? But if you did, you'd need to know it works out like so. This is g dot the curl of f minus f dot the curl of g. Well, obviously, let's see here. The gradient, now this one's really out there. The gradient of the dot product of two vector fields. All right, you ready? Here it is. It is the curl <laughs> of the curl. Oh, I'm sorry. It's the cross product of the curl of G with F plus G cross the curl of F plus, and then here's an interesting new one that we haven't seen before. F dot nabla acting on G plus G dot nabla acting on F. I guess you know what three is going to be, don't you? Yep. It's the divergence of the cross product, I should say. Yeah, I haven't talked about it. Di divergence of curl is easier. I'll spare you three. You can look at page 342 of the notes. Let me just expand on what does f dot del mean? This term would be like f1 partial x plus f2 partial y plus f3 partial z. All of that on G. Wait, wait, why did you say F dot del? F dot nabla. Del is also nabla. Del equal nabla. Sorry. Now, what that is, is a vector. This is a vector. It is f1 partial x plus f2 partial y plus f3 partial z on g1. And then the same for the other two, all right? I mean. <laughs> disgust? Utter disgust. All right, I. It's true though. Yep. Hmm. 
It's an interesting identity. Oh, I did it again. All right, let me, let me go on to something a little bit more interesting, actually. I, I will not subject you to the proof of these. I'm sure I've asked them as homework at various years. I think you'll find the solution to some of them or all of them in my previous work. What's actually much more interesting are the, the, the second derivative identities. So here, uh, proposition 7.25. And these are as follows. One, the divergence of the curl is 0. Two, we already proved the curl of the gradient is 0. Three, though, three is something. The curl of the curl of a vector field is actually equal to the gradient of the divergence minus the so-called Laplacian of f. Yes, sir? I'm sorry? Oh, it's in the notes. It's uh, del of How's it go? Oh. I have the gradient of f cross g, which is a kind of weird expression, right? That must mean actually that's a new thing, I think. I mean, what, is that, what does that mean? That doesn't seem right to me, actually. I don't know what that means. Yeah, I don't know what gradient, I don't know what nabla of vector means. There's probably a typo there. I'm not sure if it's missing a dot or a, well, I already got that up here. Um, and uh, it could be that it's supposed to be, maybe it, you know, it's probably supposed to be the curl of that, yeah. Yeah. I think that's what it's, I think that's the typo. It's just the curl of the the curl of the cross product. I think that's all it is. It's it's there's a cross product. There's a cross product missing in my notes. I could work that out. What is this? I mean, we could I could work it out. Like this. And I'm going to go ahead and bring the, there's a summation that comes from that too, of um, L and M. And so I've got epsilon I, J, K, epsilon, this one gives me um, L, M, J, partial I of F, L, G, M, X hat K like that. And what happens is this goes into two terms, like this. So you get these two terms from that derivative, right? And it turns out that there's an identity for the product to this, the, the, if you have two epsilons contracted like that, the formula is, um, oh, so move the j. Um, well, that's the same as epsilon i k j epsilon j m l. I just I went ahead and slipped. I, I, I can. 
there's a, there's an even number of even number of flips keeps the sign the same, and then it turns out that this is equal to the Kronecker delta um, summation. If this is summed over k, summed over j, this actually works out to the Kronecker delta of um, I m Kronecker delta k l minus the Kronecker delta I l Kronecker delta k m. And so this expands into those two terms. This expands into those two terms. You multiply them, you get four terms, and that's where the four terms in, in the identity and the notes come from. Hey, I didn't want to do that. What you did, curses. Yes. Uh, yes. Anyway, so that's a sketch of the proof of that, which I again I think is in previous year's homeworks as well. Um, this gradient squared is just what you think it would be. So what's nabla dot nabla? It's nabla squared. It's the sum of the derivative partial x squared plus partial y squared plus partial z squared, sometimes called the Laplacian. Like Laplace with an an, like, La, like Laplace's equation, but. Right. I mean, this, for example, if we have uxx plus uyy plus uzz, we could rewrite that as Laplacian squared of u. So it's a, Lapl it's a way of writing Laplace's equation in terms of the nabla. Wait, why did you say zero? That's Laplace's equation. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Right. I mean, that's extra. Without the zero, it's just an expression. All right. That's a definition. This is just notation. Okay. There's there's really nothing to derive. It's it's formal nonsense. I mean, it's a, it's a notation which is reasonable with the idea that we think of nabla as a vector of operators, but that's just a heuristic tool for remembering formulas. Don't don't think of it as more than that. Now, we can prove number 1. I will I will show you the proof to number 3 at the end of class. Hopefully, but before I do that, I want to talk about what does this mean? What is it good for? And so that's the other major reason we study vector calculus in here. Besides fluid flow, which is interesting enough, you can also think about uh, physics, right? And the, one of the principal places in physics where we use fields, vector fields, is in the study of electromagnetism. So in the study of electromagnetism, you study two vector fields, the electric field and the magnetic field. All right. Um, the electric field and magnetic field arise in response to the presence of electric charge and moving currents. Moving currents generate magnetic fields. Uh, electric charges generate electric fields. And these things called Maxwell's equations govern the um, interdependence of the electric and magnetic fields. In particular, these are Maxwell's equations in the, in the vacuum. So I'm going to tell you, Maxwell's equations in vacuo. Um, the divergence of the electric field, zero. The curl of the electric field is minus the time derivative of B. The divergence of the magnetic field is zero. The curl of the magnetic field is equal to mu naught epsilon naught times partial E partial T. So for us in here, for the most part, we're not thinking about vector fields being a function of time. The problems we consider in here are what you'd call static. There's no time dependence. Like, right over here, we had like x, y, z, f of x, y, z. There's no time, right? There's no time in this example. But physics, right, cares about time. So we add an extra wrinkle. The vector fields depend on x, y, z and time. They're time-dependent vector fields. Um, unless, of course, you're in the situation where you have a, you know, a, 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 a physical situation which is time-independent, and, and then you can drop that time and you're back to the stuff we do in here. <coughs>